Saints Row is one of those series you could ask multiple people about and get completely different answers from each. The common thread is United States gang culture, but by the end of the series, before the upcoming reboot, even that's out the window. If there's one word that describes most of the series' entries, it's unique. Especially these days, with Grand Theft Auto V continuing to be a juggernaut dominating the open-world crime sandbox genre, the Saints Row games are a breath of fresh air. I'm really fond of this series, and while not every entry is phenomenal, its great games and unique history make it worth examining in detail. What the games do well, what they don't get right, and how the series evolved over time. Beginning its life under the hilariously cheesy name Bling Bling, the original Saints Row is best described as an interesting historical curiosity. Of any game in the series, Saints Row 1 stays the truest to the original American gang culture theme and is the most grounded story of the bunch. Not to say it aims for gritty realism. There are plenty of goofy moments throughout the game, including its insistence on using street lingo like homies and cribs, and the game adopts a lot of GTA's typical sense of humor with satirical radio ads, jaded radio DJs, and a bevy of ridiculous shop names like Rusty's Needle Tattoo Parlors and Friendly Fire Gun Stores. The game begins with character customization, one of the things Saints Row is most well known for, and although it's more limited here than in future titles, you have a surprising amount of control over how you sculpt your character's features. You could make reasonable lookalikes to real people, or you could totally warp the poor guy's face to hideous proportions. I bet you can't guess which camp I'm in. Once you've made your character, you're treated to an opening cutscene that establishes the setting of the game quite well. Caught up in the wrong place at the wrong time, the playa is caught up in the crossfire between Stillwater's primary gangs, getting saved by Julius and the Third Street Saints. From here, you're free to roam the city at will, but you won't be able to unlock any story missions or play side activities until you at least complete your induction into the Saints, where the basics are introduced to you. Your typical GTA fare is here, getting a weapon, getting a car, going to stores, and using safe houses. One of the major selling points of Saints Row at the time of its release was its full, seamless map available from the beginning, along with a standard set of third-person shooter controls for combat instead of the auto-aim heavy combat of the era's GTA games. The controls overall are solid, nothing exceptional, but they get the job done. The camera kind of sucks though, there's no setting where it feels great to use. It's slow to start turning and never feels fast enough even at full speed, and while there is some bullet magnetism present, it sometimes feels like this was a bit too ambitious. A few other features set Saints Row apart as well. It was one of the first of its kind to allow you to shoot in any direction while driving, you can recruit any random Saints member as an ally to help you in combat, gaining the ability to lead up to three by the end of the game, you can hold consumable food items to restore health at any time, keeping up the pace of the game. And the game's focus on gangs is also reflected in its notoriety system. There are separate notoriety gauges for police and all three rival gangs. Any police notoriety will always be displayed at the bottom of the map, while the gang with the highest notoriety will be displayed at the top. While a novel concept, it isn't executed very well. At 1 or 2 stars, you'll catch the attention of any member you pass, but it's not until 3 stars that any of them will actively start to send things after you. The game's small population density at any given time makes it actively challenging to gain gang notoriety, as it will decay faster than you can increase it in most situations. Getting to 5 star gang notoriety is incredibly unlikely during normal gameplay even if you're trying. 5 star police notoriety is much easier to attain, but highlights another flaw. Saints Row 1 only includes cars and trucks. Motorcycles, planes, helicopters, and tanks are all absent, and even though Max Police Notoriety swarms you with the strongest vehicle in the game, it's nowhere near as threatening as any of the 3D GTA games. Notoriety is cleared in a simpler, more fair way than GTA. Just roll through a forgive and forget for a fee, and you're good to go. No vehicle customization needed, $100 per star. Saints Row is also one of the first open world games to include a GPS. It can be a crutch, but you'll always have access to it, and like any good GTA map, the world design is good enough that you'll start to recognize areas on your own as you explore the world. 
the game might look a little bland being an early Xbox 360 title, but its districts are distinctive and recognizable, from the slums of Saints Row and its surrounding areas to the buildings towering over downtown, the suburbs, and even the Chinatown district, it's got a lot of character right from the get-go. The main plot of Saints Row involves taking back control of Stillwater from its three main gangs. The Los Carnales, the Rollers, and the Vice Kings. The Carnales. What? Rio Grande River. Jesus. What the fuck? It's not the Los Carnales, it's just the Carnales. Los means... Fuck it. After the introduction, you have to earn respect levels to start new story missions and start getting territory, constant cash flow, and safe houses. The main way to earn respect is to help outside characters by doing activities and diversions. Activities are bigger events that can be found across the map, and diversions are smaller affairs you can start just about anywhere in the world for a smaller payout. Activities are what you'll spend most of the time in Saints Row 1 doing as a result of the respect gates, so what will you be doing? There's snatch, drug trafficking, hijacking, escort, hitman, insurance fraud, mayhem, chop shop, demolition derby, and street racing. Most of them are exactly what the name suggests, and most of it is your typical GTA fare of defending an NPC, going to a location to kill an NPC, etc. The most interesting of the bunch are Insurance Fraud and Mayhem. In Insurance Fraud, you get to play with the game's physics engine and purposely ragdoll yourself, trying to get hit by cars and get sent flying for a large payout. And in Mayhem, you essentially have cheat codes on and have to destroy as many things as possible within the time limit to rack up a high score. While far from perfect, insurance fraud suffers from the low number of cars on the road, for instance. These two modes play into the strengths of the game, rewarding what most players play games like these for in the first place, and although there can be some fun to be had in the rest of the modes, they're rather banal in comparison. Fully completing an activity grants you additional perks, typically but not always related to what you finish doing, including the game's best weapons and damage resistance perks. The rewards for full completion make it more reasonable to go through all of a particular chain of missions rather than diversify and play a lot of different modes, but because side missions all end after 8 stages per area, you're likely to run dry on activities you find enjoyable and are forced to either do activities you don't enjoy or tackle a lot of diversions to cover the difference if you're set on seeing the story mode through. Diversions include tagging, where you find a rival gang's tag somewhere in the world and paint over it through a quick minigame, CDs, which reward no cash or respect but are unique collectibles hidden across Stillwater, hostage, where you take someone hostage and keep your speed up to avoid their escape while also avoiding the police, holdups, where you keep a gun aimed at a shopkeeper until they open a safe for you, and theft, where you break into the safe yourself with a quick minigame and deliver the contents to a nearby pawn shop. Of these, tagging and hostage are the most interesting and most lucrative, encouraging you to explore the world and being a more thrilling version of escort respectively. But the respect payout is still much lower than any activity. True to their name, they're more of a diversion than a serious way to avoid activities to progress the game. Although character customization is a focus for the series, it's at its worst here. You're free to buy and wear whatever you like, but you get multipliers on respect gained from completing activities if you're dressed up in purple, expensive outfits, and as much bling as you can graft to your ugly mug. Instead of encouraging individuality, the system tends to result in everyone dressing the same. So, is it worth struggling through activities you might not enjoy just to see the story through? Unfortunately, I'd have to say no. The Carnalis, Rollers, and Vice Kings each control a particular part of the city and encompass a particular aspect of gang culture. The Carnalis lead the Stillwater drug ring, the Rollers control car-related dealings, and the Vice Kings are in with the police and various legitimate business operations to finance gang activity. The Carnalis sees you disrupting their drug ring and assassinating the gang's leader. His brother barely reacts to this, tries to take it to you, then tries to flee, dying in a plane explosion. The Rollers sees you following Lynn as a mole, getting fed information to ruin the Rollers' schemes until she gets caught and killed, after which you take revenge and kill the leaders. The Vice King sees you disrupt their business deals until an internal fallout dethrones Benjamin King as leader, leading you to rescue him and take the fight to the wannabes. 
Despite the clear setup, none of the stories are particularly deep or interesting, and although some of the characters are interesting, the overall plotlines don't tend to be, and because you can tackle missions in any order, none of the three stories interact. You only learn about Saints Lieutenants and their own plotlines, and the power dynamics between the three gangs don't get a chance to be explored. Troy, Dex, Lynn, and Johnny Gat are all good, but none of them get big moments to shine like the Lieutenants in future games. On a gameplay front, main missions rarely have you doing something you couldn't be doing in a side activity, often having you try a side activity anyway. Another relic of the time comes from the game's lack of checkpoints. It's aggravating having to play through entire missions again because you died around the end, and especially having to drive all the way back to your destination each time. There are a few other annoying quirks unique to Saints Row 1. Ammo isn't universal like it is in later titles, meaning it's better to pick up weapons enemies drop than buy anything from the store, making finding a weapon you like almost moot. And to facilitate the theft diversion, shops operate on a schedule and close at night. And there's no option to speed up time, forcing you to wait until morning to buy whatever you need. I can't stress enough how irritating it is to be forced into doing side activities just to play through strongholds, which are basically all just enemy gauntlets in abandoned buildings, or story missions that more often than not play like a modified side activity and don't offer much in the way of character or plot development. Overall, Saints Row 1 is a pretty standard clone of the GTA 3 formula with a few features that made it stand out at the time that are now either irrelevant, like the multiplayer or control scheme, or make it stick out like a sore thumb, like the progression structure or anemic weapon and vehicle variety. Tie this all together with a mostly forgettable plot and it being an Xbox 360 exclusive that has never left the platform, barring future Xbox platforms to be a backward compatibility, and you have a game that modern fans will likely be better off appreciating at a distance. Releasing two years later, Volition was put in an interesting position with the sequel. While Saints Row beat Rockstar to the punch the first time, Saints Row 2 would release after Grand Theft Auto 4 hit shelves. Without a tech advantage, Volition instead played to their strengths and refined Saints Row, enhancing the parts that worked, shedding the parts that didn't, and overall focused on making a sequel that's bigger and better than its predecessor in just about every way. I couldn't get footage of it, but Saints Row 2 is where the series starts to be fully playable with another player in co-op. I don't know of any other games in the genre that allow this, but it's great to be able to play from start to finish with a friend, and I'm glad it's a series mainstay from this game on. The game opens after the last game's ending, elegantly getting new players up to speed. The player got caught in a boat explosion and ended up in jail in a coma for 5 years and is just now waking up, where you can fully customize them with even more granular customization than before, including female characters. This deeper level of customization allows you to create some truly horrific looking nightmares. After a jailbreak with the help of future Lieutenant Carlos, the player discovers that during their absence the Saints disbanded. The power vacuum led to three new gangs taking their place and a familiar but very different Stillwater. The city has been expanded with a few new districts like the University District and the Trailer Park and many parts of the city has been revamped. Saints Row is barely recognizable. The only thing that remains is the church a few blocks away from the Ultor building, towering over the rest of the city, visible nearly everywhere you go on the map. It's a still water that feels bigger, better, and more real than before, with a more memorable and convincing skyline, especially downtown, more secrets to uncover, buildings you can enter, and a generally superior layout that makes getting from point A to point B a breeze from anywhere on the map. In this new still water, the boss works to reform the saints, breaking their chronic silence from the first game, as you bust Johnny Gat out of jail and work with new lieutenants Carlos, Shandi, and Pierce to disrupt the status quo and take back your city. The gang plot lines this time around are a lot more interesting, and each has their own style expressed through the weapons they use and the cars they drive. The Ronin drive fast cars and motorcycles, using weapons with quick fire rates alongside katanas. The Brotherhood drives slow but tough trucks with slow weapons that pack a punch. And the Sons of Samadhi are there too. Like the first game, their storylines unfortunately don't connect with one another, but they all have a common thread through Altor and are generally more interesting than in the first game. 
The Brotherhood storyline sees the boss meeting with Mero to establish a deal with the newly reformed saints. He offers them an 80-20 split, but this doesn't cut it for the boss, who sends a message by sabotaging his cars and lacing his new tattoo with nuclear waste. Mero retaliates by dragging Carlos across Stillwater to his death, to which the boss retaliates by shoving Mero's girlfriend into a truck to be crushed during a monster truck rally. Mero tries to seek Ultor's help by force, but once the Saints crush that plan and crash his weapon shipment, Mero is out of options and the boss takes the fight to him, culminating in a showdown on the rooftop and a finale where the boss is alone against the Brotherhood in a monster truck arena, where they put the gang down for good. The Ronin storyline starts with the Saints catching their attention by conducting a brazen heist on one of their casinos. The young leader, Shogo, doesn't take them seriously, but is reprimanded by his father, Kazuo, and Dane Vogel for his failure to get the money back. Shogo very nearly destroys the saint as his lieutenant trails Gap back to his house, holds Aisha hostage, and kills her as she tries to warn Johnny about the trap. With the personal motivation to destroy the Ronin, the saints continue the offensive while Shogo fails to get the acknowledgement and respect he craves. Shogo lashes out, selling out his lieutenant and attacking the saints at Aisha's funeral, who bury him alive in an act of revenge. Kazuo leads one final attack on the saints' hideout, ultimately being taken out in a one-on-one -on -one sword fight atop a burning boat, being left to burn to death, pinned to the floor by his own sword. The Sons of Samadhi are easily the least consequential gang. They run the city's drug ring, and the storyline sees he ruining various drug operations, but besides two boss fights, one against Veteran Child who holds Shandi hostage where you have to find a way to separate them to avoid killing her, and one against Mr. Sunshine who wields voodoo and telekinesis against you, the rest of the plot is unmemorable and the leader, the general, isn't fleshed out very much. It's also the only gang Ultor is not involved in. The characters in 2 were also more interesting than the first games. The antagonists are more fleshed out and compelling, you get to spend a good amount of time with each of your lieutenants, and they all bring something unique to the group. Johnny Gat shines here as the player's oldest ally and the only one who can match the boss and psychopathy, but he has some real human moments in the story dealing with Aisha's death. Carlos doesn't get a lot of screen time and is the least experienced of the crew, but being the first person the player meets, his death is likely to leave an impact. Pierce is the butt of every joke and gets no respect despite numerous attempts to prove himself, but he's a good strategist and the gang's failure to listen to him often led to negative outcomes. Shandi is a little more one note, being a stoner who's good at gathering info since she slept with nearly half of Stillwater and is great at lightening the mood, but isn't much in a fight. The boss is more of a character than last time too. While clearly new at running a gang, making several decisions that end up with someone important to them being killed, their utter ruthlessness and tenacity make up for it. A lot of people don't like this portrayal of the boss, but I think it works extremely well. Julius, the original leader of the Saints, and Dane Vogel, CEO of Altor, end up being great foils to them that further the game's underlying messages. Dane Vogel is essentially what the boss wanted to be through more legitimate means. Not entirely legitimate, he still had dealings with the Ronin for protection, but he seeks to own the city through wealth alone. Ultor's takeover of Saints Row only further deteriorated Sunnyvale Gardens, and even with their own police force, Ultor has failed to quell the violence of the new gangs even before the Saints reappear. In fact, this was intentional. He planned to manipulate the gangs into weakening each other before pouring money into Stillwater's police force, then buying out all the property rights from the values plummet. His cowardice is what separates him from the boss. He relies on underlings he's willing to throw away at the first sign of trouble and is never willing to get his hands dirty himself. And when confronted by the boss at the end, he tries to grovel for forgiveness and gets killed for it. It's in the ways that the boss is different from Vogel, in their loyalty to the crew and in their bravado, that they prove themselves to be the better leader, and that wealth alone doesn't make a leader. In the epilogue, Julius is revealed to be the one who organized the boat explosion that put the boss into a coma. His original vision for the Saints was a group that could clean up the city and free it from the terrors of gang violence. But like the Vice Kings before, the Saints ended up another group that simply continued the cycle. The original purpose of a street gang is to protect its community from forces that threaten it. 
But when that threat passes, or the wrong motivations at play, a gang will perpetuate the acts of violence it originally protected against. Despite proving themselves to be the more accomplished leader, the boss proves that Julius was completely right. The Saints are shaping up to be another group that perpetuates violence throughout Stillwater. While their treatment of the crew suggests the boss's reign might not be all bad, it paints the ending in a very bleak light, with the future of the Saints in Stillwater uncertain. So, with a massive improvement in story and character quality, how does the rest of the game fare? Many systems from the first game return in a much better state than before. Respect is still required to unlock story missions, and it's still easiest to get it through side activities, but it's been made much easier to get than it was before. Driving and combat stunts have been added, rewarding you for doing things like driving riskily or killing multiple gang members in a row, or in particular ways. These reward you simply for playing the game. By having fun moving around the city or engaging with rival gangs, you're actively setting yourself up to progress the story. The style system is much better too. You're rewarded for spending cash on customizing things in general instead of meeting an arbitrary purple quota. Shops no longer operate on a schedule either. It means the removal of theft, but the benefits outweigh the cons. As the boss of the saints, you have a fair amount of control over the whole gang. Its visual style and what cars they use are up to you. As mentioned earlier, there are more vehicles this time around. Motorcycles, planes, helicopters, and boats are included, with tanks being the only noticeable omission. Although the omission of tanks hurts, everything else is well utilized and the game is a lot more varied. The combat system has seen some minor tweaks. Aiming generally feels better, there's a slightly higher emphasis on unarmed combat with multiple styles, and you can grab and throw human shields, adding a bit more depth to gunfights. High tier weapons you get as side activity rewards are also unique in function instead of merely being blinged out reskins of another weapon. And along with the fix to the ammo system, you now have a lot more choices as to what weapons best fit your playstyle instead of being forced to scavenge for them on every mission. Side missions take up considerably less of the time you'll spend playing the game, but they still take up quite a bit of the runtime. It's a good thing, then, that there are a lot of new activities and diversions to spend your time on, and they're all either brand new or more interesting takes on previous concepts. Demolition Derby, Drug Trafficking, Escort, Insurance Fraud, Mayhem, Chop Shop, Hitman, Snatch, and Racing return from one either completely identical or with a few touch-ups. Mayhem's presentation is much flashier, and the increased population density makes it a lot more satisfying to wreak havoc. Insurance Fraud has been given a slight visual overhaul, and when you take enough hits, you enter a mode with even crazier ragdoll physics that send you soaring. Hitman now has you taking down unique targets instead of being a scavenger hunt for a generic NPC, and racing involves different vehicle types. The new activities typically take advantage of 2's new mechanics. Crowd control has you keeping crazed fans away from celebrities using the new melee combat system, or by grabbing and throwing them into fans, wood chippers, and other environmental obstacles. Fight Club has you taking on a group of opponents in a fistfight to the death, showing off the new melee combat system. Fuzz has you tag along with a cameraman and impersonate the police, sullying their reputation by doing terrible things. Trailblazing is essentially racing on a timer that counts down, where you earn more time by hitting people and obstacles between checkpoints. Septic Avenger has you stopping a septic truck along a set track to cover everything you can in sewage and decimate property values. Finally, Heli Assault has you following your profoundly stupid lieutenants in the air as they do drug deals and fail to drive a car in a sensible way. Heli Assault aside, the new additions are fun to play and hilarious conceptually. Each side mission only has two instances instead of three, with six missions each instead of eight, but with so much variety in the new ones, you can easily get by playing what you like and discovering a new favorite without having to touch any of the ones you dislike. Plus, you're rewarded for getting halfway and all the way through each activity, making diversifying what you play more viable. There are a lot more diversions too, so many it's tough to list them all. Barnstorming, stunt jumps, CD collection, tagging, base jumping, ambulance driving. There's not a lot to the activity ones, but they're reasonably fun to do, and there's a lot of collectibles for those driven to do so. The collectibles are quite well hidden too. 
A favorite of mine is at the airport, where you're required to drive through the wreckage of an airplane to land on an adjacent rooftop, then climb to the top of another building nearby. The story missions themselves fare better too. Strongholds are a lot more substantial than raid this abandoned building, and missions usually have you doing things you couldn't be doing otherwise in another activity. There's a lot more interesting set pieces and boss fights as well. Every gang has at least one memorable encounter, and the most serious moments of the story often come after the most intense gameplay segments. If Saints Row 2 falters anywhere, it's in its budget. Visually, it can't hold a candle to GTA 4, and although the population density fares better than 1, it's still quite a bit lower than contemporary games of its kind. The imbalance between gangs and police in terms of gameplay is still evident. It's a bit easier to get up to 5 star gang notoriety, but what they throw at you is hardly comparable to 5 star police notoriety. Goons with rocket launchers versus armored helicopters and APCs. The game's PC port, unfortunately, is incredibly rough. There are horrible audio quality issues and physics issues related to the game being tied to CPU timing. And although there are third party fixes like Gentlemen of the Row, it's not exactly an ideal experience. In the future, this will end up being the best way to play the game as Volition continues to work on an official patch, but there isn't a release date in sight yet. Surprisingly, Saints Row 2 stays true to the gang culture focus of the original despite the addition of silly and supernatural elements. With a rock solid foundation, plenty of things to do and ways to cause chaos, and a well told plot with a great cast, it's no surprise that many consider Saints Row 2 to be the best in the series. The decision to drop the port of the original game in favor of making two multi-platform was absolutely the right call, with the game coming out the other end much better for it. With an ending that leaves us uncertain of the future of the Saints in a conquered Stillwater, where could we go from here? How could Saints Row 2 be topped? The answer Volition came to was to take the series in a different direction. Displaying its level of self-seriousness right from the beginning text crawl, Saints Row the Third amps up the comedic angle of the series and downplays the series' roots in gang culture. Taking place a few years after 2, the Third Street Saints have become a household name and are major celebrities. They take method actor Josh Burke in on a bank heist to help him take on a role in an upcoming movie about the Saints. It's more for show than a serious bank robbery, at least at first. The heist goes awry, and the Saints get caught, trapped by the Syndicate, a massive criminal organization moving into the US. The Saints are given an offer they can't refuse. The boss characteristically refuses, fighting their way off the airplane and landing in the Syndicate's home turf of Steelport, with Johnny Gat presumed dead and all their funds completely drained. The opening missions display a loud and clear where the story's priorities lie. Bombastic, memorable set pieces, and the rest of the game certainly continues to deliver. Whether it's storming a penthouse to Kanye West's power, blowing up a warship, or racing an elevator down a tower on a steel chandelier, the game knows how to leave a lasting impression. The core gameplay is no slouch either. Every major mechanic from the previous game feels significantly better, especially driving into combat. You have more movement options in combat, and every weapon feels unique from others in its category. They can all be upgraded individually too, becoming totally different from others in their class by the end of the upgrade path. If there's any problem with the system, it's that by the end of the game, these upgrades become so overpowered you can blitz through the toughest parts of the highest difficulty without any problem. That's not even considering the new vehicles you get to play around with. Tanks and VTOLs are in the game, packing a serious punch and feeling just as strong as they should. Vehicles are where the game shines the most, and two mechanics in particular make Saints Row the Third what I believe to be the best open world crime sandbox game out there on a mechanical level. The first is the garage. It's been a thing since the original, but you can store multiple vehicles in your garage at once and summon them from any garage in the game. 2 introduced the ability to summon them at will, and 3 carries that ability over. The second is Quick Hijack. By holding down the sprint button, you'll quickly enter the closest vehicle nearby instead of waiting out a long animation where you go around a car to get inside. It's that good. It lets you effortlessly keep up the pace and switch from car to car in a fraction of the time it would take in other games. Combat is also refined in that there are multiple new enemy types to deal with. 
Each of the three branches of the Syndicate has its own lieutenants. The Morning Star employs snipers to pick you off at long range, the Luchadors carry rapid fire grenade launchers, and the Deckers have quick moving specialists with shock hammers that stun you, leaving you vulnerable to other enemies. All gangs also have brutes at their disposal, huge enemies that can't be run over and take a lot of sustained fire to kill. The wide variety, along with the removal of food items, encourages experimentation and thinking on your feet as you move between cover. At higher difficulty levels around the mid-game, it can start to feel a little too limiting, but it's rarely overwhelming either. Respect is no longer used to play story missions. Instead, Respect acts as a leveling system, granting access to unlockables like infinite ammo and damage restrictions that were formerly rewards for activity completion. Combat and driving stunts return and will give you respect until you max out that category, after which they give you cash. A good way to make them consistently useful in small ways and to encourage you to vary up your playstyle. If you wanted to, you could play through the whole story from start to finish. And the way the game is structured essentially flips the series structure. You're forced to experience the storyline to get the most out of the game instead of the activities, and while some players might not like this, I feel it was the right choice because of how restrictive respect gates felt in 1 and 2. While side activities and diversions still give out cash from respect, since they aren't required for story progression, they're instead required for territory control. Completion of many activities gets you control of the area in question, which allows you to buy stores in the area, netting you a discount, and the ability to duck into them and instantly erase your notoriety. It's a good system, if a bit forgiving, and let the designers feel more confident in making notoriety rise faster for all groups and give them more options than ever to deal with you since you can always instantly take off the pressure. Steelport, as a location, is unfortunately a lot less interesting and memorable than Stillwater. While still split into unique districts under the control of a different gang, with notable landmarks like the casino and the airport, the map's much smaller scale, abundance of high-rises, lack of explorable buildings, and the similar color palette used throughout the city make it blend together in your mind. It's possible to learn its layout, but it isn't as effortless as Stillwater, and its lack of identity is also hindered by a smaller number of activities and diversions. Insurance fraud, mayhem, trafficking, heli assault, trailblazing, escort, snatch, chop shop, and hitman all return in some form. These are all about the same as they were before, with some slight enhancements, so what was fun is still enjoyable, but the absence of crowd control in a game about the saints being celebrities is a little peculiar. And to most of the additional activities, Tank Mayhem, Cyber Blazing, and Tiger Escort are much smaller, less interesting spins on existing ones. The only new activity is Professor Genki's Super Ethical Reality Climax, a game show parody where you mow down everything in your way and navigate an obstacle course for a cash prize at the end. Any excuse to flex the game's combat system is a good one, so these tend to be a good time as well. Most diversions return from 2, but absent are any of the vehicle-related jobs. They weren't the greatest in 2, but their absence is felt here and makes Steelport feel a bit less lively. The game's story is oddly structured. It somewhat fits the three-gang structure of the previous titles, but it's more of a linear narrative that occasionally lets you pick the order in which you tackle objectives. It avoids the problem 1 and 2 had, where the other Saints lieutenants were rarely involved in other plot lines, but along with the Syndicate encompassing all three gangs, it makes the individual gangs matter a lot less. They're essentially all arms of the same group in different costumes. The Morning Star are the head honchos, the Deckers are the high-tech cyberpunk hacking group, and the Luchadors are the masked wrestling enforcers. After calling in Pierce and securing their new headquarters, the Saints take the fight to Loren, boss of the Morning Star and Gat's murderer. They recruit various residents of Steelport who have been wronged by the Syndicate to disrupt all their operations, killing Loren shortly thereafter. Head of the Luchadors, Kilbane, teases control of the organization, senselessly snapping the neck of one of the new Morningstar leaders to assert authority. Her sister Viola defects, helping the Saints take down the weaker branches of the Syndicate. The gang violence hasn't gone unnoticed, however, as the Luchadors' destruction of the bridge in Stillwater caused the government to turn their eyes towards Steelport and deploy Stag, an anti-gang military force, to wipe out all of the groups. After forcing the Deckers' leader, Matt, to flee, the boss takes down Kilbane in a fair wrestling match. 
causing him to attempt to flee the city. The boss is given a choice, however. Stack has Shandi hostage atop a local monument set to blow up, and there's no time to accomplish both. There are several major decisions throughout the story, though most don't particularly impact the plot. Getting permanent bonuses based on what you do is nice, and there are appropriate reasons to pick any given option. The final choice of the game determines the ending you'll get, but in the canon ending, the boss saves Shandi and the saints become even bigger celebrities than before. The storyline on the whole is decent, but it doesn't have the emotional stakes that made 2's plot memorable, and the boss's psychopathy has been toned down significantly. Whether this is good or bad is up for debate, but it does make Kilbane a slightly more interesting character as a dark mirror of the boss if you choose the canon ending. The boss sticks to their guns unfailingly, and the loyalty they have to the saints, even the new members, continues to make them a more likable character to play as. The new additions to the crew are a bit more polarizing. I like most of them, but there's too many new characters and too little screen time for some of them to be truly memorable beyond their character traits. At least Pierce is given more respect in this game. Shandi, on the other hand, is even less impactful than in 2. Combined with the radical personality and design change, and it's hard to believe she's even the same character. There's a few other minor negatives to bring up. Motorcycles and smaller vehicles tend to get caught on level geometry and launch you off more often than you'd like, and a lot of mission starting points are obnoxiously far away from previous missions to accommodate talk time. The removal of food items is a double-edged sword. While booze and weed didn't contribute much apart from world building, food's removal encourages a playstyle different from the frantic, head-on approach it encourages in the first two games. It also feels like the game is trying to say something by bringing up the newfound celebrity of the Saints and their consumerism-focused drive, but the Saints losing touch with their roots isn't really touched on beyond the alternate ending where they eliminate Stag by force and take over the city. There's also substantial DLC to cover as well. Genki Bowl 7 is the weakest of the bunch, being a bunch of variations on existing side activities wrapped up in a very loose overarching plot, but if you're itching for more Genki-like content, it's decent. Gangst is in space as he's filming a movie in which the boss is praised for incredibly awful line delivery, while his co-star is continually berated for having the audacity to exist. It's a good showcase of the direction they wanted to take the boss's character. A much more relatable, empathetic character whose drive to succeed is admirable rather than frightening. The trouble with clones is essentially the prototype of Saints Row 4. Johnny Gat has been cloned, and it's up to the Saints to stop him from going on a rampage, with a super-powered finale that's a fun romp if a bit simple. With Saints Row the Third, Volition still didn't have the money to go head-to-head -head with GTA and thus went in another direction, picking quality over quantity. While this worked out great mechanically, other aspects like the world design and activity variety suffer for it. Still, there's a lot to love about the game too, more than a lot of people give it credit for. If you're looking for a game in this style that's not GTA, Saints Row the Third is the most accessible of the bunch and is available on just about every platform. The only logical place for the Saints to go from Steelport is to the White House and beyond. The crazy dial has been turned up to 11 from the very beginning of this one, with the boss now being the President of the United States. This doesn't last long, however, as an alien invasion results in the Saints getting kidnapped, witnessing the destruction of Earth, and fighting back against the Zin in a virtual steel port. And that's about the extent of the plot, at least as far as it really matters. The story focuses on rescuing fellow saints trapped aboard the mothership to mount an offense on Zinyak at the end, but it's not nearly as interesting or even as important as the story was in other entries. Instead, most of the focus is on your companions, Pierce, Shandi, Kinsey, and the like, with the return of Johnny Gat. These character stories are far more interesting than the rest of the plot and make the game feel like a love letter or a swan song to the series as a whole. Plots like Shandi's struggle with self-worth and survivor's guilt in the face of Gat's apparent death and her various kidnappings, Pierce's feelings of insecurity, and Johnny's guilt over being unable to save Aisha are all explored with care, and the parodies and references the game is stuffed with are incredibly loving and respectful to the source material. From a Metal Gear-esque stealth sequence to a Streets of Rage beat-em-up, even characters like Julius and Mero show up again, giving longtime fans even more character interactions to eat up. 
The game's good ending leaves a comeback open, and though it doesn't seem like we'll be seeing this crew again anytime soon, if this was the last time we saw these characters, that would be good enough in my book. In terms of gameplay, 4 feels more similar to 3 than 2 felt similar to 1. They're both running the same engine with nearly the same map with the same underlying systems attached. The same underlying combat system is here too, feeling just as good with tweaks that stop health from regenerating in combat, requiring health pickups instead, and weapons customization that's a bit more granular than before, tweaking the balance a bit. Four's major change and defining feature is the addition of superpowers. These range from super speed, super jumping, gliding, stomping, elemental blasts, telekinesis, and more. Using vehicles is mostly a thing of the past. Moving around on foot feels great and only gets better with upgrades. And clusters throughout the city that serve as your collectibles also serve as currency to upgrade your powers with. Your different powers being on separate cooldowns encourages you to switch up your approach, especially in situations where you're swarmed by powerful enemies. In most missions, time spent with superpowers is balanced with time spent with typical gunplay, and guns are surprisingly useful tools even while you're powered up. There are no rival gangs this time around. The only notoriety you have is with the Zin army. It can't be wiped by entering a building either. You'll have to catch a golden Sid flying across the map, which makes things a little tougher while still offering you an out. Like 3, activities and diversions grant city takeover, cash, and experience, and though some return, many of the ones that wouldn't work as well with superpowers have been removed. Most of them are mild variations on existing concepts. There are 4 versions of Mayhem, for instance, but they're fun ways to explore your superpowers if you're so inclined. The best ones are the ones that directly test your new abilities. Ability Rifts, Professor Genki's Mind Over Murder, and the new Superpowered Fight Club are all standouts. I wouldn't blame anyone for comparing the implementation in this game especially to how Ubisoft litters its maps with things to do to fill out a checklist, however. Especially after the novelty of superpowers has worn off. 4 also includes two very tongue-in-cheek DLC storylines. Enter the Dominatrix is styled after a mockumentary of the making of the cancelled Saints Row the Third DLC pack of the same name. And How the Saints Save Christmas is a ridiculous holiday romp where you help future Sandy save Santa Claus from the villainous Claus. With a W. And a Z. These aren't essential by any means, but if you enjoy the sense of humor the series has been rolling with since 3, these should be right up your alley. Saints Row 4 is a bit conflicting. On one hand, I think the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay is a lot of fun and often surpasses the best 3 had to offer, but it's barely a Saints Row game at this point. Any pretense about the story focusing on gang culture has been eliminated, and as an open-world sandbox, it completely fails not only because of the nearly identical map, but the size of said map being small to begin with. As a superhero game though, it's still one of the best out there, and if that's what you're looking for, it's absolutely worth giving the game a try. The last game before the reboot, Get Out of Hell is essentially a standalone DLC for 4 and should be treated as such. Its plot is unimportant, and its gameplay consists almost entirely of activities and diversions with a grand total of 2 story missions. The power system is basically identical, with telekinesis replaced with the much less fun summon minions and gliding being refined into flight that controls like a better version of Super Mario 64's wing cap. Despite taking place in the capital city of Hell, New Hades manages to be less interesting than Steelport. It's much smaller with even more bland visual design. Some of the characters are fun, like Shakespeare and the returning Dane Vogel, but they can't make up for the rest of the game's shortcomings. There's no character customization in a series famous for it, no radio whatsoever, and if you've already played 4, most of the content Get Out of Hell offers is going to be old news to you. The best part by far is flight and its associated challenges, but like Saints Row 1, if that's all you're here for, you're going through a slog of content you don't want to do to reach one of the multiple endings. Unless you're very interested in the flight mechanic or are dying for more Saints Row 4, this one is better off skipped. If nothing else, Saints Row is an interesting look at a game developer continually redefining their series. 
with the result mostly being a success. It's had its ups and downs, but they're some of the finest their respective genres have to offer. The reboot is only days away, and it looks to be a return to the formula that made 2 and 3 great with a sense of style and flair the third had in spades. Here's to hoping it's great. A challenger to Grand Theft Auto's throne is always welcome. If you've made it this far, thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the video, I would appreciate it if you could leave a like and or comment down below. And if you want to see more of these long form analysis videos, please consider checking out my other content and subscribing for more in the future. Until next time, I'm Forma, and those are my thoughts. And I didn't swear once. Wait, but Dex swore. Does that count? Ah, oh, fuck!